if I listen to the clip that is uh, that, that is attributed to him, mm. he argues it very fluidly. But then, against the backdrop of whatever else has existed, why now? Why wasn't it this eloquent previously? Why wasn't this raised earlier? Why, why didn't he raise it earlier? Audible previously. From 2012 to, to 2019, he has had an opportunity all these years. Okay, I want to ask the question, why has Parliament not passed this law? Let's bring in a member of Parliament, shall we? Yes. Honourable Milio Thiembo joins us on the line. Good morning, Milio. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Situation Room. Thank you. Also joining us on the phone is a commissioner with the Gender and Equality Commission, Priscilla Nyokabi. Good morning, Priscilla. And we were speaking, uh, we were speaking with Priscilla last week on this particular issue. And here we are. <laughs> It, 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 has, it, has hit that, it has hit right where it has hit. So, <laughs> first of all, I want to start, start with you, Honorable Milio Diambo. You um, have been a member of parliament for the last three parliaments, right? You yes. are You were in parliament when we were uh, promulgating this constitution, which means, and in fact, if my memory serves me right, you served in the Parliamentary Select Committee on Constitution Review. Yes, I did. So... You understand the genesis of this whole provision very well because yes, you discussed this. You went to Naivasha, you discussed this. You were elected in 2013. It uh, went to parliament several times. You were again elected in 2017. And here you are, the Chief Justice says, you know what, um, Honorable Milio Diembo and the rest of you, okay. you ought to go home. Why yeah. haven't you met the constitutional requirement? Uh, first of all, let me say that I agree with the Chief Justice. Um, his position is actually the legal position. Uh, Parliament has actually, the matter has been before Parliament a number of times. Uh, most of the times when the bill comes to Parliament, we either lack quorum, and uh, a lot of times you see members being deliberately bewitched, mm -hmm. or... Um, I, I don't even remember actually when 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 we've had uh, the quorum. Uh, maybe if we did, it could be one. But I, because we've been at this too many times, I've, I've stopped even following the count. But I know there was a there was a Dwale one, there was a Dwale two, there was a a Judy a Judy There is a a bill by even Gladys Bosholey. There, there is one by the the Committee on Implementation. So there are many bills that have been thrown all over, and each time um, it reaches a critical stage, the members sabotage the bill. So it's, there's been no goodwill in, in the part of Parliament to pass this law. Why is that, Honorable Mili? Why would they sabotage this bill? Well, the same old story that... Um, the same reason, the same story for which we actually push for an for affirmative action, that there are male members who do not want to see many more women joining parliament. Uh, but if we are also honest, there are a few women mm -hmm. who do not want many more women in parliament. Uh, they will not say it very loudly, but there are some muted voices of women who do not want because they think that will be. Too many, but we are we are many because uh, there was somebody who played a pharmacy, I mean, who enacted a pharmacy action so that they can also be there. So I, I think it's uh, self-defeatist, but majority of the ones who oppose it are actually men. Yeah, not all men, but uh, a number of men who think uh, they don't want uh, many the, more women in parliament, mm -hmm. and because mainly most of them. It's because of the success of affirmative action that they don't want it, because they have seen women who have been, uh, who are nominated before and who have gone on to be successful, like Honorable Lesuda, who was nominated before and uh, then vied for an elected position and fell down the former member of parliament who was a man. They have seen the case of Honorable Sophia Abdinur, who did the same. They have seen the case of Honorable Sarah Correra, who did the same. They have seen the case of Honorable Mishi, Honorable Aisha. I can give you the, the, the entire list that many of the women who have been nominated have done, have had a good showing when it comes to elective politics. 
But there's this argument that has uh, been brought forth by the Speaker of the National Assembly who says, in fact, yeah. this obligation is on the states. There's no direct obligation on Parliament to ensure that we have more women uh, being elected into Parliament. There is state obligation to ensure that there are more women appointed, more women in appointed uh, positions. Uh, but when it comes to elections, when he says the state, then um, it's actually running away from the reality mm -hmm. because um, the, what, what he actually means is when if you say that the, the state should um, undertake other activities, yeah, mm. including affirmative action. But when you talk about uh, taking activities, including affirmative action, the state has actually brought bills, which then parliament has failed. And the constitution makes a directive that the parliament be dissolved, not the state be dissolved. So it's actually, we can't run away from it. I know because this is a very uh, uh, critical uh, step in ensuring the, ge the gender um, uh, process, then we will try and look for, you know, the scapegoat of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll try and put all our sins on, a, on, on some goat. And in this case, our goat is the state. <laughs> but uh, the sole responsibility is with Parliament. Right now, going forward, the... It's really up to the, the the president how he'll decide to move with it, mm. because uh, even though the the president is told he shall dissolve parliament, there is no time frame, so he can decide to play around with that. Uh, even though uh, it's there's an expectation in law of reasonable in terms uh, of of time uh, when he needs to dissolve parliament. Mm. Um, Priscilla, yeah. you said, I mean, looking at statements that have been published today in terms of what you said, Priscilla, you said, and I quote, we have done enough talking on this. It's time to take the next practical steps. And this is what we will be exploring tomorrow. So in terms of a practical step that was taken by um, CJ um, Maraga, do you think this was the right direction to go? And do you think it would yield results? Thank you, thank you, Udu. I, I think that um, the Chief Justice saw the games that Parliament has been playing, and, and Honorable Milley speaking to them. And, and the, the responses that you are seeing from our male leaders are the very same responses they've been giving the bill in Parliament. They just assume that this is not a constitutional obligation for Parliament, and began to cherry-pick, you know, what to implement and what not to implement. Mm. So it is good that it has come to this. Uh, the Chief Justice has now put it rightfully on the table. There is no running away from it anymore. And I'm particularly happy about that because, honestly, it has been a game, it has been a dance, and it's been unfair to the women of Kenya. And I'm sad that some of the positions the leaders are taking are very insensitive to the gender that requires the two-thirds uh, matter implemented. Mm -hmm. But on to practical steps. There is an active bill in Senate, the bill by Senator Mutula Kilonzo Jr. and Senator Fartia. And that bill is the one that we have always had in the Duale. It is the old uh, Sijeni bill mm -hmm. that they have revived. That bill has already done the timelines that are required for our constitutional bill, and the bill is at second reading. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that the president uh, gives parliament, uh, up to the end of this session, the session ends in December, for parliament to enact that legislation because it is ready. Uh, the House Business Committees in the Senate and the National Assembly can take this matter very seriously and prioritize it. The parliamentary groups, uh, the president should call a parliamentary group of the Jubilee and the prime minister, the parliamentary group of the ODM, and the senator Wetangula, who has really never supported women, you know. So he also should call his party, and we should now call all the leaders to do the right thing between now and December when the session ends. That's about 60 days. Mm. If they fail to do that, I think the president will also have no choice. We just got an election and we elect new men. We will respect the constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm. it needs one last chance uh, because there is an active bill. Allow the active bill to make progress. And, and now with the dissolution in sight, because the president cannot lose sight of the dissolution that he has been advised on, uh, we think that that should be sufficient pull. If anybody has been joking with this matter, they should now know it is not a joking matter anymore. Mm. 
we we've we we know that he's always been um an encourager of inclusivity and also when it comes to women however is this enough and even though he supports the inclusivity of women in government even if it's just a said thing so far do you think that support goes all the way towards something like the dissolution of the dissolution of parliament to have this achieved do you think that the goodwill is present in order to see that come through uh, what it will do is uh, because Parliament, the National Assembly and Senate are the sort of uh, uh, primary institutions of governance uh, at the legislature level. Actually, we left the formula. Is, uh, we left the formula well done in the assemblies, both at the county executive level and at the county uh, assembly level. Mm -hmm. uh, the BBI, really to be fair to everyone, does have some uh, proposals for resolving this matter once and for all, including, you know, sort of better uh, ways of bringing women onto the uh, Senate, for example, through direct election, so that they can then vote, uh, like we saw the women senators were not able to vote in the formula. So these matters are properly addressed in BBI, so it is mm -hmm. important to say that. But now, the BBI is not on the table, because the BBI hasn't even been released. So the practical steps now is to do what needs to be done to respond to the constitutional crisis that the CJ's uh, decision uh, gives, and then thereafter deal with the issues that you're raising, the culture, the extent of the reform, because this part should also be replicated at all levels, including private sector, uh, churches, you know, coffee organizations and all that. But the first place to start is the National Assembly and Senate. And it is not true to say that Parliament has no obligation uh, I'm finding the speaker very unfair with that statement because what has Parliament been doing for the last seven years? Mm. Why didn't they say that they have no obligation in 2013? Why say it now in 2020? Mm. You should have said that in 2013 so that then the women of Kenya would have known where to go if Parliament uh, was not obligated to pass the law on the two thirds. But a lot more needs to be done. You're right. I mean, this just shows gender resistance. Mm. And that is why I'm happy to start with the leadership. When we wrestle with the leaders, yep. The other men will be easier for us. Oh, in Guinea, Kinala, Tiff, out to Tapamana, too. Like, Kinia, we are going to go. I want you to be too. 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 I want you The lower levels, we can the education, you know, training, gender roles. You can deal with those. I love things that we gender responsive budgeting, fighting gender based violence. All of those things continue because it is a societal issue. We're speaking with the Commissioner with the Gender and Equality Commission, Priscilla Nyokabi, and also speaking with the MP for Suba North, North the Honorable Meili Othiambo. The conversation continues right here on Spice FM, KTN Home, and online on www.spicefm.co.ke and our social media handles. We're speaking with the MP for Suba North, the Honorable Meili Othiambo, and Priscilla Nyokabi, Commissioner with the Gender and Equality Commission. And as we went to the break, um, it's it's the two ladies have basically uh, agreed that look this is a failure by parliament to enact a law that it was supposed to have enacted from the very beginning they went to the supreme court supreme court said let's achieve this progressively but by now we still haven't seen the enactment of a law that ensures even sets out a formula of how we're going to uh, uh, achieve that gender, gender balance in parliament so, you see, what I find interesting is the bit about the men are the majority in parliament. That yeah. is easy to understand. Yeah. That they don't seem to support this bill is also easy to understand. What I have actually not understood is... And it's not all. It's, let's not blanket it. Well, I, I'm blanketing it just for the, for, for the purpose of what For I the conversation. Okay. Yeah, for the conversation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the blame from what we hear seems to be placed on the head of the men. It's the men, the men, the men. Mm. Now, what I haven't heard is... The efforts that have been made by our women parliamentarians, what have they done in, in terms of lobbying, in terms of uh, structures, in terms of alternatives? When we were talking about the spoils that should go to the counties, we had of very many suggestions coming up. Yep. Uh, try this, try this formula, try the other. I haven't heard of that. So maybe it, it has been there, maybe they have made attempts which have turned out to be futile, but I haven't heard of it. So maybe, uh, maybe you could tell me yeah. the, about the efforts that have been made by the ladies in parliament to try and get this thing to, to pass through. Yes, I can actually tell you. 
uh, member, women members of parliament have done extremely a lot mm -hmm. to try and get this uh, bill passed, including uh, sponsoring, uh, or urge, urging our own members to sponsor the bill. That's how come you have Judy Sijeni. That's how come you have Gladys Fauchelet. And if you notice, Gladys Fauchelet is also slightly different from the earlier one. And uh, we've also tried um, looking at it from political parties' primary bills because many women are being failed at that level, but which will only cure a little bit of it. Uh, we were brought, even through miscellaneous application, um, a, a, a provision uh, that where parties don't, uh, the parties that do not actually meet the one third rule mm. should not get the requisite um, money uh, from the political parties. Mm -hmm. It has also uh, been uh, dropped in parliament, it has been defeated in parliament. And the, we have actually used so many angles to try and bring this, um, um, you know, sort out this issue. The greater challenge, though, is that uh, because of the way the Constitution was framed, and I understand the history why it, 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 it has a defect in relation to the National Assembly, is that largely for us to get those numbers, you need a constitutional amendment uh, so that you can think of uh, either mixed member proportional representation, mm -hmm. or, use, or you could use a party list alone, or you could use... Uh, uh, you know, the top up, which is used at the, the lower level. Mm -hmm. We have actually examined this separately. We have had parties, we have danced, we have uh, jumped, <laughs> we have kicked. We have done everything that is needed, uh, that is moral under the sun. Mm -hmm. so, oh, the only ones we have not done are the immoral ones. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of men would you say have been supportive of this bill? Well, the percentage of the men that have been uh, supportive prima facie has been large but not sufficient because for a constitutional amendment, you need two-thirds. Mm. Now, why I'm using the word prima facie is because where the rubber meets the road, uh, you can also play uh, games by giving us 70 or 100 men who look like they support <laughs> but denying 10 who make the whole difference. Right. So you look at, uh, you pick the 10 uh, that don't give uh, a damn whether they are branded or not. Mm. And uh, then they um, they take a hardline position. And then we you are, you are denied the quorum by just 10 men, men uh, when it looks like over 100 actually support you. Uh, but uh, from what we have uh, had or seen in the past, it's a sufficient number that have been supportive. But then I think the other issue that we need to talk about is that when you talk to men offline or, or uh, off, uh, in the background, then they're like, we do not want these numbers in Parliament because those are huge numbers that are coming in. Mm. So we have suggested a different formula, but that different formula uh, then can, we may only need to, we, or rather it's sort of like the one that is being suggested by... Uh, BDI, but then even the BDI one, the men in some men in Senate are opposed to it because then the BDI proposal will increase the number of women in Senate and reduce the number of women in National Assembly. But mm. in the in totality, then Parliament will be two thirds because then it proposes one woman, one man mm. in in the Senate. Yeah. And because if you do that one woman, one man, then you'll have had a very big, uh, you know, number, which an equal number, which if then you had with the number that is being suggested in Parliament, would uh, uh, give the, you know, the requested number. But there are many solutions and suggestions that we have been given. There are people who have, I think, uh, Honorable Agostino NATO with this Green Movement in the last Parliament, mm -hmm. also suggested a pairing in constituencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, which which also people didn't want. So it becomes very because if you go with the uh, the uh, the counties, then you only end up having uh, the 47, which is not the requisite number. Mm. If you look but at all these, I know sorry. I know people have also suggested uh, reducing constituencies. That is a near impossibility. If you look at all these uh, ladies, both the Honourable Diembo and Honourable Nyokabi, it 
the last 10 years, and even, uh, I'm sure you'll both uh, look at it and say, even during the debates, uh, uh, during the drafting of the Constitution, the conversations that you even held in Naivasha, Honorable Odiambo, you will see that the political class really has a problem or is unable to come up with a way to sort out this issue and ensure that we attain the gender rule. What else then can be done outside of, you know, the National Assembly, uh, the Senate, to get this thing rolling, to get this ball rolling? Should we be looking back and seeing, look, we wanted this for our country, but it appears like um, it's not getting the support that it requires from the general population of the country. Let's review it and find a better way of, of doing it. You know, Eric, well, let me just come in now. Yep. Okay. Because we don't, hello, we don't yes. want to go to options fast because what has happened with this resistance, we have to start with the law. There, there is, I mean, if we try to start from the society, that's even harder. So it's got to be a legal solution. And that is why the matter was put in the constitution in the first place because of the difficulties around it. And so whichever way we turn, it will have to be an amendment, a constitutional amendment, increasing the space. And, and that, uh, the options have been given. I know that the National Gender and Equality Commission looked at as many as 10 formulas uh, before arriving at the Article 177 type of formula, the nomination, and even looked at the cost of implementing the two-thirds gender rule. And there is a report on cost which shows that uh, the cost is negligible. So there are other things that can be done outside Parliament but let us not get away from where uh, it starts from. It should start with lawmaking, it should start with the constitutional amendment, and it should start with leadership. Uh, they, they, they can't run away. You know, if you look at something like devolution, it was very, very difficult to implement devolution, required billions of shillings to implement devolution. But because that is a male-dominated arena, there was no problem implementing that. The two-thirds, the reason there is resistance is just because it is a gender issue and it is women at the, at the lower end of the stick. So let's not get away from the source of the problem. It must be parliament, uh, so that parliament does not say, as Muturi likes to say, that the state is all of us. That even we, in the private sector, we are part of the state, even the court is part of the state. Let the matter and the ball squarely be on parliament to pass the laws that are required for the society to then follow. And these solutions are tabled before and we think that the little time available now should be spent on resolving the matter. The amount of effort the president took on the formula is the amount of time the president should now take on this matter of the two thirds. And mm. the interventions that were done with the uh, Senate are the interventions that should now be done on this two thirds matter and there is an active deal. Mweshimua, so the, the, this, this law that you speak of... Don't let us go to the village. Let's stay in Parliament. Mweshimua, this law that you speak of, what will it look like? Will it uh, enable Parliament to appoint more women? Will it enable... No, it enables, like the county assembly one, after election, and you don't have the requisite numbers of women elected, then you use a party list to nominate them. And the Senate now requires only two women, and the National Assembly required about 22 uh, women to fulfill the full two-thirds. Mm. So it, you top up. It's actually called the gender top-up law. Mm. You top up after the election. So we can even have a debate on whether to implement it now or to implement it with the next election. But there should be a formula. Actually, at this point in time, the fight is for the formula uh, of how to dissolve uh, the two Apart from the top-up, has election. there been any other suggestion? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I do not know of this other suggestion. The top-up makes sense. But what else has there been? Well, she's talked about the uh, city. The one on uh, you know, political parties looking at uh, the representation and selection and all. But... All of them appear to be flopping, and the only one that seems to always to rear its head up is the one for nomination. You know, at the end of the day, they all sound like if the number, the requisite number, will not be arrived at, mm -hmm. you will... Top up. Nominate top up. You will you will be engaged in some form of top up. Mm. Honorable yes. Odiambo, does it sound like nomination then is the only way to go when it comes to some of these things? From the get-go, have women nominated and then see what they can do from there? Um, nomination is not the only way. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, we have examples, um, amazing examples from Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, the, the way Rwanda has gone around it. Look at the way South Africa has gone around it. Look at the way Tanzania has gone about it. Look around, uh, look at the way, you know, uh, Uganda, which we actually, the system we have right now is Uganda 
minus the numbers. But if you look at uh, countries like South Africa, what they do, excuse, it's not nominate women, but the parties use a list before during elections so that people are voting for a list. Mm. As, as we are campaigning, people are voting for a list so that if we give people a wrong list, like let's say if I'm putting an, in a list in my constituency, then people will say, yes, we agree with the, with the, the, the ODM list. So that when it goes through, based on how, what uh, um, um, numbers that you get in Parliament, then you are entitled to um, get those people on your list so that it's not exactly a nomination because people will be voting for people in a list. That's mm. what I'm talking about, mm. a mixed member proportional representation or yep. the party list. Mm. Uh, so there are different formulas that can be used that don't necessarily just have to use uh, the top-up. The only reason that we're looking at the, po the, the top-up right now is because of the, the constitutional uh, possibility of, of framework of, uh, of amendment the one that is actually plausible at this point is that. Mm -hmm. The other would require do it going the BBA way and referendum. And uh, the reality is that because this is actually an issue of, um, that is uh, controversial, if I may say, whenever you're talking about groups that are marginalized, it will always be controversial. And I'm glad that this is coming immediately after uh, the, the impasse that we had at Senate. And you could hear the voice of uh, the, the, the communities that feel that they've been marginalized over a long time. Mm. We're li listening to voices of communities that feel that they're minority communities. They never get what they need in a silver platter. It has to, to involve some negotiation, yeah. and there must be an element of affirmative action in whatever form, and not only through uh, the top up. Mm. But there, where there is a will, there is a way. So, like in this one, we, we, we were treated to theatrics for quite a bit of time, but now there is actually a solution. Mm -hmm. So, in the same manner, the only way I would agree with the Speaker of the National Assembly that it involves the state is that now um, the Chief Justice has extricated himself. And so now the action is squarely on the foot of the President. Uhuru Kenyatta. Mm. And uh, in that sense, uh, now it is squarely on the state. Uh, before then, it was on parliament. The ball keeps shifting. Mm. It was before parliament, and parliament failed to do its uh, part. It moved to the chief justice. And I remember I was in a meeting where I told the chief justice, I, I indicated we had a meeting of the law society. And I said, yes, the parliament has done its work because you, are, you do your work either by uh, affirming or not affirming, mm -hmm. failing or not failing. Either way, you will have done your part. If a kid sits for exams and fails, you don't say they've not done their exam. Mm -hmm. They have done it, they've just failed. So Parliament had done its bit and failed. Mm -hmm. It moved to the Chief Justice, and we were telling the Chief Justice one month ago that now you are the one failing because the ball has, passed, has been passed to you. Mm -hmm. He has now done his part. The ball is now up to the president, Uru Mudai Kenyatta. Yeah. So he can to choose to perpetrate or he can choose to, to uh, score. kill the boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to score. So it's actually up to him. He can perpetrate, which means he will delay with it, or he can score, or he can yet again uh, disappoint um, the women of Kenya. Interesting the way you put it. The ball is on the right at the desk of Uru Mudai Kenyatta. Interesting the way you put it. Does the president have an option? Um, and this now brings in, and both of you are lawyers, brings in what the Constitution says, the CJ shall advise the President, the President shall dissolve Parliament. Is there an option here for the President? The President has a leeway, but not... A, sorry, let me let uh, Priscilla... Priscilla, you can let start. Let me just go, because I also want to get off to another meeting. Yep. But just to uh, see, the President has an option around time. Uh, because there is no timeline in the Constitution. Mm. So the President can use some time to give Parliament the last option. But I think the President has no option. If this matter is not resolved, he will have to dissolve Parliament. The only thing he can do is give a last chance uh, between now and when the session ends. We are also aware about the BBI. The President also is a big leader of the BBI. 
So the president now must uh, lead in terms of the solution to this problem. And if there is no solution in reasonable time, because there is no timeline stipulated, then there is no, uh, there is no further debate for him. He will have to dissolve the House uh, as per the Constitution. And, and, you know, that is the constitutional order, because in constitutions you don't pick what to implement and what not to implement, which is what has happened hmm. to this matter of the two-thirds. The, people, I mean, the leadership just chose not to implement this matter. Otherwise, it could have been implemented, and it needs to be implemented even now. So play with timeline, but at the end of the day, uh, we are looking at uh, a dissolution of the House. Mili? Uh, well, I could say that uh, to a large extent, I agree with uh, my sister uh, Priscilla, that um, the president, the only way he has is in relation to time. Because when the constitution says the president shall, then there is no discretion there. So the discretion that he has is in relation to time, because there is no time that is put in, you know, in place for him to dissolve parliament. Mm. Uh, however, if you are to talk um, very strictly legal, uh, or if it's, you are a president that is minded with uh, constitutionalism, then we know that even where you have discretion in relation to time, it must be exercised judiciously. Right. That therefore means that you cannot exercise your discretion in a manner that goes against the spirit of the rule of law, because the president, unfortunately, has increasingly been setting um, a standard uh, and, and a legacy of uh, disobedience of uh, court orders mm. and non-adherence to the rule of law. Um, on the other hand, uh, the Chief Justice has done something very interesting, that just before he's retired, before his retirement, he has pulled this um, major decision. Mm. What is his legacy in terms of the rule of, rule of law? He's exiting at uh, 100%. Mm. <laughs> uh, people may agree or disagree with him in relation to the decision that the Supreme Court made in the electoral petition court. I mean, uh, the electoral petition uh, issue, the presidential one. But it has been lauded all over the world as a brave decision, mm. even though people may disagree with it politically. But it was a brave decision. So that is actually um, a feather in his cap. And then he has done yet, gone yet again and pulled another major feather, mm -hmm. which is uh, to very boldly tell Parliament, uh, you can go home. Yeah. That is also a very brave uh, rule of law decision. What about the president? What is this brave uh, rule of law moment? Will he, as he has done again with the cases of the judges, uh, hold back? But then I would want to add on something here, that I think for the president now going forward, uh, it will, uh, I suspect he will use more um, uh, real politics that, as opposed to uh, <laughs> the law. <laughs> and what do I mean by that? We have actually given the president um, leverage uh, or boosted his uh, political lever leverage without realizing mm. that that what that means and I'm, I'm now I'm speaking politically I'm not yep. speaking legally mm. uh, that the president has this um, opportunity that uh, he can actually what contrary to what most of us think the president can decide this is a dysfunctional parliament we are all over his uh, head with too much noise go home so that I can start with the with a parliament that can, you know, deliver my agenda. Right. And he can do that because uh, we pass the, the budget, he can move on until the next parliament comes in, mm. or he can decide uh, to use it um, as a negotiating chip with parliament. Or uh, he can, you know, he can use it in whichever way, way he wants he chooses. politically. Politically. Yeah, and that is speaking politically. Looking at gender equality and looking then at the dissolution of parliament, let's take a few steps forward and then if the imagery would, would assist and say that parliament is actually dissolved, do you, does this then bear any weight on this fight for gender equality? Would it then see... Would you, would, is, is one equal to the other? Would you then see steps moving forward in this race towards gender equality in, um, in, 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 in government positions? Would it make a, that much of a difference? Is Priscilla still there? No, she's not. Uh, this is, uh, oh, okay. Then 
I could uh, respond. I mm. think there would be a, a forward movement because the constitution is not clear. Mm. I mean, it's clear mm. that w a new parliament that is elected would be expected to pass mm. uh, uh, the law, mm. and that if it doesn't pass the law, then somebody, the whole process begins again. Somebody can go to court and, uh, uh, you know, challenge the same parliament uh, for not uh, taking the, the action that is needed. But then I think uh, ultimately it's about um, political goodwill mm. and uh, political legacy. So would uh, it would then be important for the president to see what kind of legacy he wants to leave in terms of the rule of law? Mm -hmm. Is he leaving a very divided, uh, disorganized and unstable parliament? Or is he leaving a parliament that is, um, you know, concrete? Um, so it, it would actually then jolt uh, the political class mm -hmm. at the higher level into action, mm -hmm. whether it would be through BBI or whether it would be through a constitutional, other ways of constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. Finally, Honorable Diambo, do you think this is a popular decision um, with the people of Kenya? What I mean is, when if I... Parliament was to be dissolved today, do you think that women would stand a greater chance of getting elected in a resultant election? Well, I think I see your question as a double in this sense. Is the popular is the decision to dissolve Parliament? popular with the public yes is it popular in relation to the issue of gender on that bit people get divided why because again as i've told you when it comes to issues of minorities and marginalized communities it's never about numbers because we are talking about years of socialization um that has actually then caused us to um believe in certain issues if uh, I, I was reading uh, uh, the book uh, that i love who moved my cheese mm. and you see that there is a, a you know this um, a little a little people one of the little people i think it's called he or which one that was so stuck at eating cheese at the same place because that's how it was that's how it's always been mm -hmm. that if I, I if i was raised eating cheese at a given corner I'll never think of another alternative because I've always eaten cheese in one corner. Mm -hmm. And in the same manner, if I grew up being told that women can't lead, if I grew up as a woman being told that I'm not enough, if I'm being, I grew up being told that I can't make it, then that's the, the narrative that I have internalized. That is the narrative that has concretized. Mm -hmm. So you will see that even the general public may not be supportive of increasing numbers in the same manner that you see the popular groups are not supportive of increasing money mm. uh, to marginalize areas in, in, in the revenue allocation. Yeah. The, uh, people will be insistent of one man, uh, one shilling, one, one man, one shilling. Why are we insisting on that? Because we do not want to listen to these people who may not give us the one man, one shilling, but have a history of no roads, no water, no no blah 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 mm. so in a functional democracy you must find a way of balancing both balancing voices that cannot be heard including persons with disability youth women you know and uh, smaller communities must all be brought on board for the country to move forward okay you cannot use the numbers to um to steal voices so yes it's actually not an easy path and one one of the things that is likely to happen that we are not talking about is a backlash from parliament mm. and yes that we know will uh, that is likely to happen that parliament can then decide to bring a bill to to remove the the, the principle altogether okay that Thank we know we, that is likely to happen well let's see how it plays out thank you very much for joining us this morning on Milio Thiembo, the mp for super north uh one who's been advocating the issue of gender equality for many years even before nomination into parliament and election and re-election into the same national assembly you tested out of this poisoned chalice um now i'm sorry you have to go home according to the chief justice <laughs> wish you all the best whatever way the decision thank goes you. thank you very much we are ready mm.